guys, this is Sari Lena. Welcome to my channel. Thanks for joining us today. Today I have a special guest. But first, if this is your first video here, I help people move to Costa Rica. We have a relocation company. So if you were thinking about moving to Costa Rica and this is how you stumbled upon this video, make sure to go check out my channel for the rest of the videos because there's a lot of free tips and information that might be important for you to know. And so today we're gonna be chatting about decluttering, minimalism, and work with our clients. We have, you know, that's actually seems to be one of the biggest stressful parts that I see people going through. Unfortunately, it's not something that we can just go to their houses and help them with it, but it is one of the biggest tasks. You know, we have some people that are trying to downsize a home that they're, you know, downsize a life that they've built over 30 years or more. And it can definitely be quite the challenge trying to narrow things down for the move. So I hope that this information in this video is going to be super helpful. Um, we have Megan here. She has so much information about this and I'm very excited that she's going to be sharing with you. So go ahead, Meg, tell us about yourself, your background, the work that you do. Uh, I know you have a podcast, like tell us everything. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on Sarah. It's awesome. I've been watching your YouTube videos for at least a year now, getting ready for my own move. Yay. We're leaving in about 40 days or so, and um, our, we're, we're going to Alabama first to store just a few things with family members and say our goodbyes, and then July 5th, we'll be in Costa Rica. So awesome. it's happening. And so, um, hi everyone, my name's Meg Nordman, and I'm the author of a book on minimalism. It's called Have Yourself a Minimalist Christmas. I guess I should say, well, first, first of all, I'm a mother of two children and a wife to an avid surfer and we live in St. Augustine Beach, Florida and my husband would like to have even better waves. We are very excited to get to Costa Rica and we've been planning this for seven years now. We consider ourselves a part of the fire movement. Are you familiar with that, Sarah? No, I have no idea what that is. Uh, fire stands for financial independence, retire early. Yes, and I'm on board with that. I've already put like <laughs> five. I don't know. 29 now. I'm like, oh, let's see. And by the time I'm 35, I'm retired. I'll always do stuff though. Exactly. I turned 35 in a couple of months. So we're there. <laughs> and yeah, I would say that's probably about the, the age where most people in the fire movement are retiring. It's, I think it's been around and growing since 1998. And it's basically millennials, but it, it's across the spectrum now of folks who have figured out how to create passive income so that you don't have to work the nine to five. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can retire early if you want, but it's really more about financial independence so that you can leave a job if you're unhappy there. You know, it's, it's more about that autonomy. And um, so I talk about that on my podcast. It's Journey to Freedom. And I'm writing a book about that right now, about our journey. And it took us seven years to achieve. It's not a get rich quick thing. It's a lot of strategy, but, um, yeah. So, um, journey to freedom there. I've got my book. I'm on social media at Meg Nordman and I'm starting a YouTube channel. Um, I've got, you know, a playlist already about moving to Costa Rica and I'm trying to document decluttering and getting rid of a whole house full of stuff. Uh, because I got on YouTube as I was trying to get psyched and prepared for this myself. And I really couldn't find very much that showed you the process of getting rid of everything. I saw a few videos of people in a blank, white, echoey house going, ta-da, I did it. <laughs> Everything's gone. But, you know, a year ago, despite being a minimalist and uh, knowing how to declutter, I was still going where do I start? <laughs> this is so much to do, you know? So I've just been trying to document that entire process. And, um, and so that's what I want to talk about today for anyone else that is either in the middle of it or planning in the near future to get rid of most of their life's belongings and make this big move. So I really yeah. want to talk about the fire stuff. Let's do another episode on that because that's, okay be huge like of huge interest to other people too yeah I love talking about it cool I didn't even know about that I mean I didn't know you did that so, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely stay tuned for a future one because that'll have to be on there too and I'm going to have all of uh, Meg's links below in the description so you'll be able to reach her directly and see everything that she does too all right great 
Yeah. So um, I do want to, I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to convert people into being minimalists. You don't have to call yourself a minimalist. Um, I really just want to talk to people about intentionality and decluttering, because I think it's safe to say no one's going to move every single thing over to Costa Rica. We all have junk drawers, multiple. Uh, we all have closets overstuffed with things. Um, so some people are going to want to ship an entire container down to Costa Rica, and that's totally fine. You know, some people really do have um, that many items that they've accumulated that they truly love and they want to bring in to their new lifestyle. And then some people might have a pallet. Some folks might have 10 bags that they check. Some people might just have two. So I'm trying to include, you know, across the spectrum, all of us are downsizing to some degree. <laughs> so um, yeah, there'll be variations there. Uh, personally, and I will probably keep referring back to myself as an example. So personally, we're going to have two bags each, but I'll get back to that in just a moment. First, I wanna talk about where to begin which I consider step one, and that's to get a clear vision of your future lifestyle. I mean, super clear. You need to get the details. And this is a critical step because you need to work backwards. So for example, when I picture my ideal Costa Rica lifestyle, which you can make fun of me, maybe it's not realistic, maybe it is, I sure hope it is, but I'm imagining this really simple open air cabina or, you know, tree house structure on a stilt. And I'm probably going to be frolicking around in hippie skirts and barefoot. <laughs> I want everything open air. I want an open air kitchen. Um, I just imagine basically a structure with a bed with a mosquito net over it. And so my dream lifestyle may not look like yours. Um, but this is going to inform me on what I need to pack. So to get even more clear, I, I know I want to do more art and more videography. I know I don't want my kids to have a ton of plastic toys anymore, like what's become the norm here in the US. I really picture them just being out in nature. It's kind of the point for me is just to really immerse ourselves in the jungle and go and get out there and study and look at the animals that are everywhere there. And, you know, I just, I don't see them watching Netflix and Disney plus, I don't even see us having a TV. Um, so what this informs me is, okay, Hey, you're not going to need a TV. You're not going to need a crock pot. You're not going to need to pack all these toys. You're not going to need cocktail dresses or high heels. Um, you know, but you will need your art supplies. You need to get serious about decluttering that you will need some breathable fabrics and so, you know, get the hippie skirts, but get rid of the formal wear, you know, like you work from that vision to begin the decluttering process. And so, and you know, if, if you've spent a lifetime collecting exactly what you want for this lifestyle, say you're having an ultra modern ocean view house being built and you already have the perfect ultra modern couch for it, and you want to ship that in a container, by all means, go for it. Um, I don't want people to think that they have to declutter down to two suitcases like us, but I do want to give myself as an example. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, first step, get very, very clear on what that lifestyle is going to look like for you so that you can work towards that. Second step is to create that finite amount of space. So like I said, you, you, you now should know whether you're going to be the type of person with two bags or a container or somewhere in between. And this is your space. And this is how you're working backwards from a, a whole house and a whole lifetime of the stuff down to this finite amount of space. And this brings me to container theory, which is something that blew my mind when I read about it from Dana K. White. She is an author of a book called Decluttering at the Speed of Life. Highly recommend it, especially if you're a creative person or a mom. It's very good. She really walks you through every little drawer in your house. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good book. 
And in that book, she describes container theory. And so the first thing to imagine it is picture those plastic tubs that you would put all your Christmas ornaments in or the kind of big plastic box that you might want to put all your extra sweaters in if you live in a seasonal place or something, one of those. And now when you're stuffing those sweaters in, you're supposed to be able to shut the lid and clasp it. It has like a little clasp and suction cup thing. And you, ha you have to hear it click and now it's really shut. But the problem is, is when you have two sweaters too many or five strands of Christmas lights too many and you can't actually get it to click shut. And you have to pull out those two sweaters and you have to decide, am I going to create another box to put these sweaters in? Or am I going to re-sift through this and get rid of my least favorite two sweaters to make this fit? And so now, now that I've illustrated that, you apply that to every part of your house. So your linen closet shelf, your silverware drawer, the condiment shelf in your refrigerator, the rod in your closet, your entire house, every thing is a container and you need it to actually fit. And the problem is so many of us, they're just overstuffed. We, we can't shut the drawer with our mail or our shoes stuffed in it or whatever it is. I'm like looking around my house and like seeing problem areas still. Um, and so you have to, to get it to fit. And then when you're moving, it's even more literal. We're not just talking about a linen closet anymore. We're talking about an actual suitcase. <laughs> You know, a 29 inch by 20 inch by 12 inch suitcase that is 50 pounds. And so now we really have our container defined and now you, you've got to start working backwards. So to give myself as an example, um, we each get two bags. So I know both children, they each get two bags. I know that we're going to have a bunch of homeschool supplies and art supplies. That's probably going to be an entire bag worth of stuff. And I know that I'm going to need at least a bag of toys for the poor things, right? <laughs> so now I've only got two bags for clothes. So one kid gets a bag and another kid gets a bag. So now I need to go through their drawers and make sure I declutter it down to that space and that weight, you know, 50 pounds for you, 50 pounds for you, and we're done. Um, and so that's what I mean by working backwards. Um, as adults, you know, I get two bags. My husband gets two bags. I know I'm going to have a bunch of my art supplies and my videography and podcasting equipment. That's going to take an entire bag. Probably my husband's going to have a bunch of surfing accessories. There's a whole nother bag. So a bag for me and a bag for him for our clothes, basically. And so, um, I, you know, obviously people could have 12 more bags than that or, or whatever it is, but that's how I have worked backwards. And what I find so freeing is once you've decided on that amount, you know that the rest of it is excess, you know? Um, and this is, this is where we get into the decluttering. So, okay. I know I'm going to have these 20 hippie skirts Here's all the stuff I'm keeping. I've gone through my jewelry. Here's my bohemian jewelry. You know, I don't need the fancy fake diamond stuff anymore. I'm not going into, you know, any symphony concerts in the jungle right now, you know, so I've, I've gotten through that part. Now I've got the pure excess. And from here, you've got to decide trash, donate or sell. You know, you, you've got your piles, you've got your bags or your boxes, however you want to set it up. Um, and you don't want to save this for the very end. Um, this should not be happening to me. It should not be happening in the last month before you move. I've been literally in this phase for six months now. Um, right now we're 40 days from our move. And the only pieces of furniture I have is this table that my laptop is sitting on right now and a dresser that we keep our shoes and our Wi-Fi router and mail in. That's it. No other furniture. Uh, my kids are sleeping on a mattress on the floor in their room. They have 12 small wicker baskets of toys now, which I'm about to declutter further. 
Um, and my husband and I, we have our mattress on the floor, which I have now moved into the living room because we sold the couch and the coffee table and all that. So our bedroom is now like the holding station for what we're actually moving with. Um, so, uh, and we're 40 days out just to give people an idea of like, yes, you can survive without a couch for two months. It's going to be fine. Um, and especially if you're going to try to sell anything. So, but before we get there, trash, trash is where you start. That's the easiest thing. I can go in my kid's room and easily sift through a box of stuff and find broken toys. Like, I don't know why things get broken and then they still get put back into the box when you're cleaning, but that shouldn't happen. It's broken. Toss it, you know, random old paper dolls or art or whatever that's half crumpled and got food spilled on it. And it's still in there for some reason. Did that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My daughter's room. Yeah. I was like, what is it? Oh, what about it? yeah. <laughs> yep. And you can clean that room every week and it still happens. It's all still in there. <laughs> so yeah, you go through and you just kind of do the sweep for trash first. And then you're down to the other two categories of, am I going to sell or am I going to donate this? And so let's talk about selling. I know you and I were just talking about that, that you were also setting limits on this as well. Um, but I have a personal rule and I, I put a cap on it. I say, I'm not selling it unless I'm going to get $50 or more out of this item. Because a lot of it comes down to, is it worth selling? And so some of, you know, many of your listeners might already know this, but some may not be well-versed in the world of marketplace, for example. So let me give a quick rundown on what I mean by, is it worth selling it? Selling an item means you need to clean it up. You need to take photography of it in good lighting. You need to stage it a little bit to help sell it. Then you're going to need to upload those photos. You need to type up convincing marketing messages, some kind of description of the item. You probably need to measure it and get the dimensions. You might want to get online and get screenshots of the item to show the original price and the original marketing descriptions uh, or any manuals that are available online. Then you load it onto your site of choice. If you really want to make sure it sells, you put it on multiple sites or channels. This could be Facebook Marketplace, eBay, Craigslist, local Facebook, swap swap groups, buy sell trade groups, apps like Poshmark, Macari, Nextdoor. This takes a lot of time, <laughs> and um, and you might want to just say, okay, I'm only going to try to sell on Facebook Marketplace. Even then, there's this big element of time that you have to take into consideration there, and then it doesn't stop there. Now you have to manage all the inquiries. So you're going to get scammer bots that you have to sift through a lot um, these days. It's really increasing. And then you're going to get a lot of inquiries that are just people pressing the, is this still available button? And then they never follow up. Uh, people asking basic questions that were already answered in the listing, but they didn't take the time to read the listing. <laughs> Uh, people that want to haggle and negotiate, people that might want to coordinate a time and place for pickup outside of your home, or maybe you want to do that for safety reasons. Uh, and then people will just ghost you and not show up. So it's a really long and frustrating process. And I, I just want to put that out there of, is it worth even selling this item? Um, and if it is, then sooner rather than later. So start early. Um, I did that, you know, since I started this process really about six months ago and really was like getting rid of furniture six months ago. Um, I was able to list it high first so that I could get the most out of it if I could, if there happened to be a buyer willing to spend that much on the item. And if not, I was able to lower the price five or $10 every week until I found that sweet spot where other people saw the value in it. Um, that way you're, you're coming from a position of power or strength there and you're not just giving things away ultimately out of desperation because 
you're leaving in a week. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've literally over like the past, I want to say two months, I've sold over $3,000 worth of stuff. And yeah, I, I think that's pretty impressive just considering we were minimalist already. I can't believe we had that much stuff to sell. <laughs> um, uh, I'll give a little pro tip here. Sarah, you can edit this out if you want later, but I pro tip for Facebook marketplace at the end, it will ask you if you sold your item to somebody, a certain person you've been chatting with. And I just delete the listing or I say that I've sold it elsewhere. Uh, there's a lot of data tracking on who you're selling to for a reason. And it's really going to ultimately come down to tax collections and things in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a new thing that's now you have to pay taxes over $600 of anything sold on any of these apps and websites that we just talked about. Zelle, PayPal, like, you know, I used to let clients give me deposits on PayPal for their home rentals, but now I'm like, well, I can't know if I'm going to be taxed. And it's yeah. Something, you know? I did um, Rover pet sitting on the side just for small income and like things like that. If you go over $600, you're now paying. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of things like that now. So anyway, that's just my own pro tip of, they don't need to collect that information. <laughs> I think it's fair. It's fair. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So now you've, you've sold your items. Now the other category would be donate. And there's a couple of different ways you can approach this as well. And I think that this is really worth talking about because we are so sentimental with our items. We're so attached to them, whether it's because of a memory or because of our perceived financial value in the item, it's really hard to let go of things. And some things are just not easy to sell or sellable, but we still look at it and we're like, but this is a perfectly good spatula, <laughs> you know, I can't even sell a spatula on marketplace, but it's a perfectly good one. <laughs> you know, it's just so hard to toss that in the trash. And it's, you know, a lot of people moving to Costa Rica are very ego conscious, you know, where a lot of people are not about waste and it's utterly wasteful to throw a perfectly good spatula away. <laughs> so donating is, is a huge thing to wrap your head around and really get some kind of system going so that you can get rid of these items. Um, and it just feels good to have like this new chance at life for the items. <laughs> I'll give an example um, that just made me feel really good. I, I'm an oboist, I play in an orchestra. I just had my last concert last night, actually. I know. I don't think I'll be playing in an orchestra in Costa Rica. So the yeah. Single orchestra. You can bring your elbow and play for all the, you know, the, the animals, animals, <laughs> animals at night and everything. curious monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, for a didgeridoo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> a lot less finger work there. <laughs> Slide of the bumblebee on the uh, didgeridoo. That'd be epic. <laughs> Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, so, um, I'm ending this chapter and yes, it's sad and bittersweet because, uh, classical music and oboe has been a huge part of my life. And, uh, but I'm, I'm opting for all these other pros on my list of what life is going to be like when I go to Costa Rica. So it's, it's worth it and I'm ready, but I had this box of chamber music. So it's like quintet like woodwind quintet music, very specific that my beloved first oboe teacher that I had for a long time gave to me, he's passed away. So there's all the sentimental stuff that I have attached to it has his name on every paper, you know, and, and it's also valuable, you know, music is not cheap when you buy all this sheet music, it's copyrighted material, you know, and so there's that aspect of like, this is a very valuable box full of quintet music. I have moved this heavy box that I have never once pulled anything out of. I've never actually played this quintet music, but I have moved it from state to state to state, many, many, many apartments and houses. And I still carry this box around <laughs> music. And it always goes into the furthest corner of the closet because I never need it. Why? Why do we do this? Um, so anyway, I just gave it to the first chair oboist in my orchestra 
along with all my oboe reed making supplies, which are also very financially valuable stuff. These tools are expensive, yeah. but like, I'm not going to sell that on marketplace who there's not that many oboists looking for an entire <laughs> oboe reed making kit <laughs> um, or in the market for quintet music. So I gave that to him for free and my gosh, like to see how excited he was to get all these cool oboe tools. Um, and then the next rehearsal, all these musicians came up to me, um, you know, a, a flautist, the bassoon player, like they, they all came up to me. I didn't even realize he was in a quintet, a real one that gets paid gigs to go around Florida and play. And they were like, this is our whole next season. They don't have to buy any music. And they were like, thank you so much. This music's amazing. I can't believe it. Like our whole season's already picked out and we can't wait to for first rehearsal. And I was just like buzzing and tingling with like, oh, this music that is literally collecting dust has like a life now. It's getting appreciated now. So um, yeah, it, it, that, it, you know, it's gonna like have such a far yeah. reach. Yeah, there would actually be an audience for this music that's been in the dark. So um, I just want to share that story to help inspire somebody else to let go of something that they might be sentimentally and or financially attached to and, um, and just give it to the right person and let it have that new chance at life. And, um, and then also there's a charity thrift shop in my town and I, I'd wager most towns have one or many. Um, you know, there's always Goodwill is the most well-known one, um, but I have a, a local thrift shop. It helps the money from it helps women escaping domestic abuse situations. They actually help them. They put them up and, um, and then they're able to draw from the items as well. If they need new clothes or purses or whatever, they have that. And then this thrift shop that the community all goes to, I get a lot of things from there um, is able to use those funds to help them with their next step in life. And so that's something that really resonates with me. And so I'm more than happy to drop off trunk loads of things, knowing that this is, this is helping something in my local community. Um, there's another one in our community that is a thrift shop as well. And it helps, uh, animals like a, a shelter that's a private one. And so they do everything in their power to find these animals homes and not put them down. And so that's another one. Like if, if that's something that resonates with you, go drop your items off at, at something like that. And so just text a Google search. You can find something that feels good. And um, I also want to recommend if you have children to take your children with you for the drop off, because I've found my kids are three and a half and five and a half. So they're still really young, but they are already like they understand that concept of we have too many stuffed animals. There are other kids that could use some stuffed animals and they can like be a part of physically dropping it off and seeing all the other stuff there being dropped off. And, and it's made something click for them. And I think that's a good teaching opportunity. Great idea. Yeah. Um, and then I know I'm still on the topic of donations, but it's important. Uh, buy nothing group. Um, I think this is an international thing. Yeah. Yeah. You told me, you talked about it in the group meeting that we have in our client group meeting and I could not remember what it was called. And I was uh, telling people like, apparently there's these Facebook groups. Yeah. Like, buy nothing. And yeah. So go ahead and explain. Yeah, that's it. So buy nothing group. And I, I believe it's um, international. I know it's definitely in the States and it's in every city in the States and their Facebook groups. And um, within the cities, if you're, if your town is big enough, it's even broken down into neighborhoods. So we're in St. Augustine, which is not, I mean, not that big of a city. It's not Orlando or Jacksonville. Um, but even then we have four buy nothing groups. So for me, I'm in the St. Augustine beach buy nothing group. It's a mouthful, but you know, you type that in, there it is. Uh, whereas there'd be a, uh, another neighborhood would be called Davis Shores. So the Davis Shores, St. Augustine buy nothing group. Uh, and that way, the point of it is to make everybody, make the world a little bit more neighborly so that we're not just, you know, ignoring our neighbors that we go out to the mailbox, like you're actually interacting with people in your direct community. And the way these groups work, they're awesome. I, I can't sing their praises enough, is if you need something, you put in capital letters, ASK, A-S-K. And then you say, for example, uh, when I was starting 
when I did my audio book for my book, I didn't have a podcast microphone then. And so I was able to ask, does anyone have a professional microphone that I could borrow? And somebody in my local community had something. Uh, I needed a massive ladder to reach a roof one time. I was able to ask to borrow that. Or you could ask to receive something. People just, I'll say, hey, um, what was it I needed? Oh, luggage for this move. All my luggage came from the Buy Nothing group. So I went on there, I put ask, and I said, uh, large luggage, like rolling bag luggage. And then I gave my little paragraph story of we're moving, you know, I've already decluttered all my stuff. So I don't have any more. So I need some luggage. And I was overwhelmed with people who were like, oh, I've got luggage. I need to declutter it. Like it's just sitting in my garage. Like, um, so I went and picked up free luggage everywhere. Very cool. And so the other, the flip side is you can put in capital letters gift. And then you say what you're giving away and you put a picture of it. And, um, you wait like 24 hours and people will say, I'm interested. I'm interested because my daughter really needs this or whatever. And then you get to decide who you're giving it to. You don't have to do the first person that responded. And then everything goes through DMS, direct messages then. And then in a DM, you can give them your address and tell them, you know, Hey, I've got it on the porch for you, you know, swing by this afternoon. You don't have to interact with them if you don't want to, you know, and they'll swing by and get it off the porch. I had a week when I was really purging for this move where I had so many things that I gave away on the buy nothing group that I, I got out index cards and just wrote people's names. And I had piles all over my porch with like Susan, Terry, da, 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 you know, and people were just pulling up in my driveway, like every 20 minutes and grabbing things off my porch. And it was amazing because like everyone was so stoked and that none of these items were things that were stuff I would send to a thrift shop and they weren't worth selling on marketplace. They just didn't fit any other category. So that buy nothing group really, um, it, there's a purpose for it. You know, it really solved it, a thing for me. So enough on that. Um, I think I'll talk about next where to actually start in your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, decluttering is a muscle uh, you, uh, you have to strengthen it you have to work it out do not go and try to declutter your most sentimental items first uh, you won't have that muscle to be able to let go of anything remotely sentimental uh, your, your mind will come up with every reason for holding on to those things so to, to build up that strength I recommend starting in the bathroom first. <laughs> um, you're, you're not going to be attached to expired NyQuil mm -hmm. or band-aids that aren't sticky anymore. <laughs> 10 year old lipstick tubes, that kind of stuff. You know, you got 25 conditioner bottles with this much at the bottom or whatever. <laughs> it's so easy to throw away stuff from the bathroom, largely because so much of it really is trash you know, and you really get that momentum. You see the trash bag filling up. Um, it's easy to kind of start donating to friends and family. So you may have some bathroom items that, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff, you don't want to donate it. No one wants this half used um, skin serum, age defying serum, but maybe your 30 year old sister does, you know? And so you kind of start that step of, Hey, sis, you want this, uh, age defying serum? <laughs> you know, oh yeah. So, um, you know, you can start there. And then the next place I would move would probably be the kitchen. Uh, at least for me, that's a, not a very sentimental place. Uh, the pantry, you know, you, it's a similar thing. You know, you figure out that you have, I just actually did this uh, a couple of weeks ago, went through my spice cabinet. I somehow have a whole cabinet of spices. And I mean, some of that stuff, it's like rock hard. It looks like it's paprika, but it's hard and solid. <laughs> and we all buy one-off spices for recipes that we used one or two times. And then we never found a need for this random uh, herb or whatever it was. So, um, you know, Attack, attack that area, start looking at your condiments, things like that. And you start building up that muscle. And then you would probably move it, you know, within the kitchen, you've got your appliances, things like that. A lot of us have too many of those. We've just been sold that we need to have, you know, 
a mechanical can opener or the soda stream carbonator and not just a crock pot, but an Instapot and not just a whatever <laughs> blender, but a special kind of blender. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, somehow we, we just have way too many appliances. And so you can start getting discerning there. And then I would say clothing, though for some people you might want to move that towards the end. That's it, kind of up to you. I personally have a hard time with clothing because I love clothing. <laughs> it's hard for me, but I will say, you know, maybe it's in that middle grade of it's, you probably won't be that sentimental with most of it. Um, and one of the things I like to do is it's set rules around clothing. I know a lot of people will roll their eyes at this, but I kind of set a uniform rule for myself. And I said, okay, I'm only going to have light colored tops, whites, creams, beige, ivory, and uh, denim or black or white, like that neutral color bottoms. And so, cause that when I really evaluated, I had every fashion under the sun. Yeah. I ever had everything Two walk-in closets worth of clothes just for myself. It was obscene at one point. Mm -hmm. I probably should have mentioned I was a former shopaholic and hoarder and I came from a hoarder family. Uh, so this has been a long journey for me. Um, but I set these parameters for myself and that also helped curb the shopping by the way, because I couldn't even look at the florals. Don't even look at the new trendy colors. The new trendy styles were going with classic white tops and denim bottoms, you know? And so that really helps cut it down. I was serious. I was like only white t-shirts. So I got rid of all, you know, the high school band t-shirts and every company I ever worked for t-shirt and every just swag from conferences or whatever, you know, like, why do I have all these t-shirts? Got rid of them all. I just have white t-shirts, you know? <laughs> um, so consider that as a possible thing to help with that. Um, so anyway, clothing, then I would move on to hobby items. Again, this might be a hard thing for some people. Uh, I am a creative, I'm an artist of all types, very creative person. And creatives tend to look at every broken item and think, I can make something out of that. I can fix this. I can turn this into something. And you end up with a ton of clutter of one day, I will turn this fabric from these ripped fitted sheets into a skirt, or I will take this random thing and turn it into a lamp or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> um, so that's what I would go for next. Um, then you could start evaluating your furniture. One thing I found helpful with that is to look at furniture as square footage. Of course, we're talking about moving. So most of us are just literally getting rid of all the furniture, but not all of us. Um, so in general, um, say you were decluttering just to move from one house to another, um, or maybe you're just decluttering for the house you live in at the moment. Think of it as square footage and how much square footage you could get back. And think of like, if you look at your mortgage or your rent and you break it down to how much per square foot you're paying, does that random little table over there, is it worth taking up that much of your precious square footage that you're paying for, you know? And I felt that same way with like storage items, things I was storing in my little tiny closets. Is it worth taking up that square footage? And when you start like looking at it that way and you start looking at it in dollars and numbers, it, that to me, that really helped. And uh, I got rid of a beautiful, loved it, love this thing, beautiful antique desk. That was my art desk, my writing desk. It was all carved. It had secret cubby hole drawers all over it. It was beautiful, but it was just a clutter magnet, horizontal surfaces. They're club clutter magnets. And I never actually did art on this desk. I never sat down and wrote books at this desk because it was always covered in crap. Um, and it took up a lot of space. And whenever I finally made this realization and I sold it, like the whole house was bigger. So try that, try selling your, your first piece of furniture and get that huge breath of relief as you gain your square footage back. Um, so you're selling furniture. And then lastly, sentimental items. 
this is where the container theory is extra helpful. Um, I have one very large box <laughs> that I have dubbed the sentimental box, not just for myself, but for my husband and my kids at this point, <laughs> which is why I allowed myself to have a big box. Um, so we have one sentimental box. This is like the handwritten letters from my mother. Um, this is uh, the, the handful of actual photographs that you want to hold on to. Maybe it's the lacy baby socks that your child wore for the first time or the little baby hat that they came home in or something like that that like is for whatever reason your wedding invitation these type of things um you may want to hold on to those but you don't need to hold on to I don't know let me think of something oh I gave my husband a huge huge like cypress stump or something like that that was really cool a woodworker had carved it out into a bowl and there was like a fossil nautilus in the bottom and that was our wedding present like my wedding present to him this thing was just super cool he likes shells he likes wood I don't know I thought it was cool mm -hmm. and I don't have to be sentimental about the fact that I, this giant thing was a wedding present like we never had space for this thing anyway like whatever <laughs> so you know but you know the wedding invitation you know, I can be sentimental about that small thing, put it in the box. So just giving an example of how you can kind of look at it and recategorize things that you're going to decide to be sentimental about. Maybe you um, could do, what if you like gave that to one of your friends so you could go visit your sentimental item? Exactly. Right. You, yeah. have, like, you have something that's super sentimental that maybe you can't bring with you. If you give it to like a family member, then at least it's like still in your life, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had some really huge paintings of tropical leaves, like almost like macro photography, you know, like really zoomed in and they were really, really cool. I love these paintings, but I also knew my sister loved these paintings. And so I gave them to her and she immediately took down all her crap art and hung up my giant leaves. And she, she sent me pictures a few times. And so I'm like, every time I go visit my sister now, when I come back to the States, my cool leaf paintings will be there. And um, likewise, we have a couple of short-term rentals, uh, part of the fire movement uh, strategy. And I was able, when I was decluttering all the art, I had tons and tons of canvases and art that I'd collected over the years. And my absolute favorites, I could not bear to give away. I realized, oh, I can put them in these rental properties because we plan on owning them for a long time. And we plan on coming back to the States to like at least once a year to touch up paint and make sure everything's clean and all good there. Um, and then I'll still get to see the art that I've collected from my friends, you know, hanging there. So yeah, yeah, you can totally um, pass them down to other people. I know we had friends offer to take my husband's guitars and they were like, we won't sell them. We just want to hold on to the guitars and play with them. <laughs> oh, that's great. Good, happy. Yeah. Day. Exactly. So um, um, for in the sentimental category, photographs, that's a huge thing. And um, for me right now, as a, a mother of young children, artwork, like the art that your child creates, the thing that I've found helpful is to take photos of the art, or maybe if you have just an insane amount of handwritten letters and you don't really want to have a container for all of that, but you don't want to completely lose those memories either, take a photo. Um, one of the minimalism books I really recommend, it's called Goodbye Things by Fumio Sasaki. He uh, goes, he's an extreme minimalist, very extremist. And he gets rid of literally everything, not for a giant move, just still stays in his same city, just lives with hardly anything. Um, but goes from being like a hoarder shopaholic to straight from that to an extremist minimalist. And how he was able to do it was to take photos of literally everything. And in his book, he says, like, I was literally taking pictures of like uh, lighters, you know, like the, the random crap that's in your junk drawer. Like he was like every little thing. I took a picture of it and it's all saved on a hard drive just in case he ever decides like he needs to look through that for something to spark a memory of something. Cause that's a big reason why people hold on to things. Just, they think a memory is attached to something, you know, 
uh, and so they have a hard time. So his recommendation was to take pictures. Now, I personally don't need to take pictures of everything in my junk drawer yeah. uh, <laughs> or really any of my things, but it occurred to me, oh my gosh. So I want to save my, my kids churn out art, like 20 pieces of adorable art, imaginative, creative, cool things every day. And I cannot hold on to that much paper. <laughs> my, my mom who's a bit of a hoarder apparently did. She dropped off garbage bags of my childhood <laughs> my house not getting <laughs> it's not gonna hold up here anyway so I do want to note like people are thinking about bringing a bunch of papery stuff like yeah depending on where you're gonna live in Costa Rica like the climate's not really easy on books it's not really great for so if you have this beautiful yeah letter that you've been saving like it might get a little funky down here you know yeah. you're living like it might start getting mold on it so I haven't even thought of that cool. like just literally the climate's not really ideal for having like anything super sentimental sometimes yeah true <laughs> oh gosh and we're looking at being like on the low end of the osa peninsula and yeah, yeah, you get mildew on your skin down there <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like start the looking like a sloth <laughs> mm -hmm. pictures so when you say like photos pictures old letters like you know, depending on where you are that may not even hold up very well down here yeah so true yeah so um and and also for whatever like prepper weird reason I always imagine like what if there was a fire you know in my current house and everything went up in flames and I'll be so sad that I didn't have these photographs or whatever that I have tangible real photographs but at least I'll have a digital version somewhere and so of course you could make this complicated and you could get a scanner or you could hire a company or there's probably machines made for this that they're market these things too I literally just get my phone and put it on a flat surface and get directly over it, decent lighting, change your angle if it's glossy, you know, and take a picture. And then what I do is I have private Facebook albums that nobody can see except for me, because a lot of it is stuff that I'm like, nobody in the world would want to see any of it. <laughs> like my high school band geek pictures, you know? <laughs> um, so, uh, you can put those in private Facebook albums. And now you just have like a storage spot. It's really easy and accessible to get to. Um, and then for the kids art, I did make those public Facebook albums because I do have family and friends that would also think that their flying unicorn drawings would be adorable to look at. Um, so yeah, so about every, I want to say every few weeks, because once the refrigerator is so covered that you can't get to the handle, it's like time for me to take pictures. Mm -hmm. So take a picture. I put them in the Facebook album and then I very discreetly throw the paper away. Oh, gasp. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably have kept, I don't know, 15 total out of the hundreds and hundreds of pieces of art they've churned out in the sentimental boxes. There's 15 really cool ones that I've written their name and their age on the back, you know, so I can find it later. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how I would attack the decluttering process and, you know, have a game plan for the bigger items like your couch or your car, your house, um, kind of just take a look around and decide like, what can I let go of six months out? What do I need to wait till one month out, one week out? Um, right now I told you we're down to just our mattress. I'm like pointing at it. I can see it right now. <laughs> um, just the mattress on the floor of the living room right now. And my plan is April 1st, which is in a couple of days, uh, at this moment of interview. Um, I'm going to list it on Facebook marketplace and say that it's available for pickup April 25th. <laughs> and then, I, and after that, I have an air mattress that we can sleep on for the last couple of days. And because it's, um, it's actually like a decent mattress that would sell you can yeah. recoup a little bit of money. And then, uh, the mattress, the kids sleep on, that'll just be the side of the road. So, <laughs> but yeah, just kind of coming up with those game plans in advance. It's the way you're going to recoup the most money and not put yourself into like a frantic panic, um, at the end. Oh, one thing that we talked about in our client call with your clients, uh, the other day, was uh, someone asked about what about yard sales? Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, I don't recommend them. <laughs> I I tried to do one. I want to say like a year, year and a half ago, 
uh, went in with a neighbor. The neighbor was already going to do the yard sale. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to get rid of stuff too. And so it was a lot of work to get these items and make little tags for them all and to put them over there. And you want to know how much we sold? One dollar. We got one dollar and it was like two days of work. And then afterwards, now I have to get it out of my neighbor's yard or you would get it out of your own yard. And like, then what? You don't want to bring the clutter you've already decided to let go of back into your house. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then you just got to now go through that extra step of, do I trash it? Do I sell it? Do I donate it? And so it's just, you know, it's not worth it to me. People doing yard sales are looking for extreme bargains. So um, if you're not listing something for 50 cents, you know, they're not going to buy it. Um, it's just to me, not worth it. Maybe if it's like, if you have a really nice house with really nice furniture and you want to do an estate sale mm-hmm. route, you could make some money that way. But yeah. just a normal, like put all the kids clothes and the kids stuffed animals and, you know, your husband's chainsaw or whatever, it's yeah. just not worth it. <laughs> um, Let's see. Um, oh, do we have time for me to go through the 35 questions? 35 questions? <laughs> yeah, my 35 questions that I oh, would yeah. ask. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also want to say I'm going to put these questions on my blog. And so, and I'll, I think I'm going to embed this interview at the top and just do a whole moving to Costa Rica, Sarah Elena blog post. So if anyone wants to see a list of these questions, it'll be there. So um, yeah. yeah, I'll do that. And I'll, yeah, amazing. Let's go through it. Okay. Yeah. So um, before I start, everybody has probably heard the Marie Kondo question. Does this spark joy? And when I started my very, the very first time I decluttered anything was whenever I moved from Albuquerque to Florida. And I, I I told you I'm from a hoarder family. I was a hoarder. I just never let go of anything. So I read Marie Kondo's book. Um, she said to ask, does this spark joy? So I asked the question over and over and over again. And I got rid of stuff for the first time in my life. And I still had an entire trailer. Like, I mean, one of those long, long trailers that you hook to the back of your truck, I had a whole SUV full of stuff. And then I still had too much. We had to rent at the last minute, a giant U-Haul truck. My mother-in-law flew in to drive it behind us. Insane, total insanity. When I look back at it, I'm just like, you cannot believe I'm the author of a minimalist book at this point. (laughs) Back then it was a real problem. And we left stuff on the sidewalk. There was a perfectly good vacuum cleaner still sitting on the sidewalk because I could not physically fit it in. Um, So anyway, does this spark joy was not enough of a question for me. It was like just barely like the surface level question to ask. So here are 35 more questions to ask to get you in the mindset to get rid of this stuff before you move to Costa Rica. Okay. Is this item enhancing my life right now? Does this item add value to my life? I think that's a better question to ask. Is this something I want my children to see one day? Do I already have five of these or at least more than one? Would it be too expensive to replace? Can I consolidate? Meaning if you've got more than one, can you toss the original containers? Can you store things together? Do you have another item that will do the exact same job? Um, When I wear this, do I feel good? You know, because you only want to keep the confidence boosting ones. Uh, do I know someone who might want this more than I do? Someone who might benefit from this item more than I do? Would I really want to move this to a new home? Does keeping this item make more work for me? So get rid of the clutter and the chore. I'm talking like dry cleaners, maintenance. Think, think about that. Do I have the time, the energy, the resources available to maintain this item? Could I make some money selling this? Have I used this item in the past year? Will I use it in the year ahead? Not might use it, will I use it? If I was shopping right now, would I buy this again at full price? And I'm talking with inflation, which is insane right now. (laughs) If it is broken, is it worth fixing? Um, And I like to go a step further and ask, is this something worth fixing right now? Like literally stop decluttering and go fix the item 
right now. Don't procrastinate the clutter. If there's a button missing from that dress that you want to keep, go get the sewing kit and sew that button on right now. And if you don't have the time or energy to do that right now, get rid of it. Okay, that's so box. Do I use this item often? Do I have something that works better? Do I really need this? Is it essential? Is this necessary for my current lifestyle or my fantasy lifestyle? And then I have to pause right here because I feel like there's some wiggle room here because we are all moving to Costa Rica and we're chasing our fantasy lifestyle. So normally I would ask this question of people when they're, they're not planning a move, they are living in their house in the States. They have their nine to five job. They only take a one week vacation and, um, but they have a walk-in closet full of resort wear and everything else is just crappy stuff that doesn't make them feel good. In that case, you would tell someone, look, you don't go to resorts. That's your fantasy lifestyle. You need to stop accumulating that and you need to declutter this and go and invest in some nice work clothes and some nice, like normal walking around clothes, you know? Um, but in this case, <laughs> we're going towards our fantasy lifestyle, right? And I will say, I, have, I feel like I've been um, over the past few years, like knowing that this move was really going to happen. I've been kind of collecting the clothes for my dream Costa Rica lifestyle. And so now I get to get rid of all the crappy normal life clothes <laughs> and I don't have a nine to five anymore. So I can get rid of the work clothes. I'm not going to have any interviews that require a suit. I won't be in an orchestra wearing a black ball gown. I won't be going on date nights to fancy swanky places. Uh, so I don't need 85 black cocktail dresses. Uh, so in this case, you know, let's think about this current lifestyle, fantasy lifestyle. What is the real lifestyle you're decluttering towards? Okay, moving on. Do I love looking at this item? Am I holding on to this out of guilt? Uh, there's a lot of feelings of wastefulness and uh, or sentimental guilt. Um, am I saving this just in case? That's a big hang up. Am I holding on to this out of fear? Am I holding on to this out of a poverty mindset or a lack mindset subconsciously, you know, making me hold on to this. And that was a big thing for me uh, that I had to get over. Um, am I holding on to this because of sunk cost bias? That's another biggie. What I mean by sunk cost bias is if you spend a hundred items on a hundred dollars on an item, and then you go spend another hundred dollars renovating it and another hundred dollars maintaining it, your brain is going, I can't get rid of this. I'd be wasting $300, even though it's a thing you no longer use or need or enjoy anymore. Um, you know, I have a really nice pair of fry boots that I used to wear. And then I went and got them resold. So that's more money spent on them, but I don't need these in my new life. And it was very hard to get past the sunk cost bias of there's like $500 into these boots, you know? So, uh, be aware of that. Um, are these items keeping me from using the space in the way I want to? Normally that question is applied towards the house you're in currently, but it can apply towards moving as well. So for example, um, if you have a jewelry box that you want to take to Costa Rica with you and it's just overly stuffed, I'm sorry if I'm digging, I need to close the tab. Okay. Um, yeah, so am I using this? Is this keeping me from using the space the way I want to? Okay. Is this item a need or a want? Can I live comfortably without this item? Am I just being sentimental? If so, will this sentimental item fit into my designated sentimental box? Am I just trying to fill up blank space? Would I be devastated if I lost this item? Usually the answer is no. Is this item something I could easily borrow from a neighbor or friend? Can this item be replaced inexpensively again? Should I ever happen to need it? Am I holding onto this because I'm afraid I will lose memories? And to that, I have to say, remember that the memories are not in your things. They're inside you. You're not going to forget your Aunt Jane just because you got rid of Aunt Jane's brooch that you never wear, you know? When planning this move, I ask myself constantly, is this worth paying for twice? And what I mean by this is, for example, is this couch so special to me that it's worth the $2,000 that I paid for it initially? 
And then also the hundreds or the thousands of dollars it's going to take for me to put it on a container to ship it there. So I'm going to be paying for this couch twice or a smaller item, yoga mat. Um, I know that I want to do yoga in Costa Rica. Um, it cost me $30 for a yoga mat. Is it, and it will probably cost me something like that to haul a yoga mat to Costa Rica. <laughs> you know? So am I going to pay for it twice or am I going to sell this right now um, or let go of it or give it to my sister and then just get one when I'm down there? Do I really want to pay for this twice? Can I recoup some money now and then go buy it? The exact same thing down there or a better thing that fits my lifestyle a little better. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's my questions. I'll put those on my blog and um, you can just type in Sarah Elena. I'll put that in the blog title post so you can find it. And um, yeah. I am so stoked for people to hopefully they've made it to the end of this video and received all this amazing information. Cause this is just, yeah. I mean, this is, this is just so much amazing information jam packed into one, uh, one video. Oh, I'm, I hope it's helpful. I know it's so hard. It's so easy to get overwhelmed by this amount of stuff. So you, know. so you said you had a YouTube playlist already of like pro, of your decluttering process. Yes. Perfect. Well, but I would love to put a link to that below too. And a link to your YouTube channel and that particular okay. playlist. And I know you, you sent me other links of helpful information and the questions and things like that. So. <laughs> all the links. And oh, I do all the links I, down there for everybody. All the links. I'm getting a, a drone. I just want to say I'm getting a drone and I will be documenting the heck out of this move. We're buying land. We're going to be building. We're going to be living off grid, super remote. And I just want to document the whole thing. It's just in my blood. It's like the creative in me. I don't know. And also like there's a teacher in me. I just, I like to show people things. I, I have so many people like yourself that I seek out that are trailblazing. You know, I'm, out, I'm always looking for my digital mentors, as I call it, to see like, oh, how did they do this? How did they build a tree house in Costa Rica? You know, like, so I, I just, to me, it feels like giving back. Like once I gain any bit of knowledge on something, I just want to put it back out into the world. So anyway, I'll document all the things. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited to follow you along on your journey. And it's going to be beautiful and amazing. And I can't wait to see the updates. And again, I would love to do a second video to talk about the fire concept. Yeah, whatever you call it. I would love to. Hugely helpful for people, even myself. You know, I'm always looking into those kinds of things as well. So I'd love to do a separate thing on that. And if that's already happened, then there will be a link to that already in the description, depending on whoever's watching this and what time. You know, if you're watching, if this was done a year ago, I'm sure that link's down there now. Um, cool. Oh, I'm stoked. I am very passionate about talking about it. it cool. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and spending your time talking about, you know, everything and sharing everything that you have. This has been hugely helpful. And again, for those, this is your first time on my channel. I help, we help people with moving. You're welcome to go over to my website, look at our relocation package. You can set up a complimentary call with me and we'll talk through any questions that you have and um, kind of start to identify some logistics that you might be moving through in your move. And yeah, I just want to say thanks again. And I'm really excited to get this video up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me on Sarah. And oh, you're it's so really fun. awesome. This has been fun. Stay in touch. Keep sharing about your move. And I can't wait to see the updates. All right. All right. Thanks again. Bye.